Hey everyone, and welcome to the beginning of week four of Gilmore Month here on my channel where we've been covering his solos, discussing them, analyzing, doing tutorials for, so on and so forth. All things David Gilmore for the past three weeks. Now, over the past few weeks, I've done a couple of tone analysis videos for certain Pink Floyd solos that I've covered. But today, I want to have a look at David Gilmore's fantastic guitar tone in more of a general sense and the evolution of his unique sound and tone, along with the gear used to shape and mold these tones over the past 50 years or so. This is going to be part one of a two-part having a look at the gear that shaped Gilmore's tone in the early years through the late 60s to the late 70s, the first 10 years basically, from A Saucer Full of Secrets in 1968 through to Animals in 1977. In part two, we'll cover The Wall, The Final Cut, Pink Floyd 2.0 without Roger Waters, and Gilmore's solo output during that period up until more recently. Now, of course, Gilmore began his musical journey with Pink Floyd in the late 60s, when it goes without saying the amount of musical gear available as it relates to the guitar was extremely limited. Uh, the amplifier, of course, had been around for 20 years or so at this point, so there was a fair variety of amplifiers to choose from for the recording and performing guitarist. However, guitar pedals for distortion, fuzz, delay, modulation were still very much in their infancy if they existed at all. There wasn't much, to say the least. And in the early days of Pink Floyd, Gilmore's tone wasn't much different from most other guitarists' tone at the time. A guitar, an amplifier, maybe a fuzz pedal, and the occasional primitive delay unit, uh, which Gilmore would go on to rely upon heavily over the coming years in his quest to separate himself from the pack tone-wise. Though, to be fair, he was starting to experiment with delay almost right from the get-go, much more so than a lot of other guitar players at the time, as he obviously saw the potential in it for shaping his tone. Yet, in 1968-69, he mostly used it for psychedelic effect, and not so much as a fundamental aspect of what would go on to be his signature guitar sound. In 1968, when Gilmore replaced the uh, by now quite mad Sid Barrett, uh, he pretty much used the same gear as Sid, and some of Sid's very own gear. Uh, his amp of choice during his first recording with Pink Floyd on a saucer full of secrets was the Selmer Stereo Master 100 Water with matching cabs. Now, Selmer were one of the biggest and most popular amplifier manufacturers in England at the time, yet others like Vox and Marshall would cleverly market and attach themselves to certain certain bands that were a big part of the British invasion and beyond, which led those brands to dominate from the late 60s and into the future, leaving virtually every other amp manufacturer in the dust. Uh, many would close up shop as Vox and Marshall began to dominate the market. Now, with regards to the effects that David Gilmore used during this period, there were basically three, and three alone. Uh, the Dallas Arbiter Fuzz Face pedal, an occasional Vox wah pedal, and the Binson Echo Rec 2 delay unit. Because, to be quite honest, there really wasn't much else on the market at the time, even if uh, one wanted more. Well, probably because Jimi Hendrix had all the other ones. Uh, there was the Univide pedal, uh, I suppose. However, Gilmore would go on to prefer the rotating Leslie speaker-type cabinets in the coming years, rather than the Univide. Now, though not the first fuzz pedal to ever hit the market, that distinction would go to Gibson's Maestro FZ-1 Fuzz Tone, released in 1962. The Dallas Arbiter was the fuzz pedal of choice for most rock guitarists at the close of the 60s. The, uh, the Vox Wah pedal, sparingly used by Gilmore, at this point in time was pretty much the only game in town for the newly and accidentally created Wah effect, uh, discounting the, uh, the Dunlop Crybaby Wah, which was pretty much a straight-up copy of the Vox. Gilmore's third item in his effects chain at this point was the aforementioned Binson Echo Rec 2, a large Italian-made delay 
lay in a box unit comprised of tubes, spinning discs, and metal tapes to record and play back the desired delayed notes. Uh, Gilmore also heavily relied on its cavernous reverb feature. Uh, this is the important one, obviously. If there is one effect that completely defined Gilmore's sound and Pink Floyd's in general during the 70s, it's the Binson Echo Rec 2. Both Gilmore and Richard Wright on the keyboards used it to great effect to create sounds that were quite new and innovative at the time in rock and roll music. Now, before skipping ahead a few years, I suppose we'd best mention which guitar or guitars that David Gilmore was using at this point, because it wasn't his famous Black Fender Strat. Uh, I believe the entirety of Saucer Full of Secrets was recorded with a blonde Fender Telecaster and a Levin six-string acoustic, which was made in Sweden. Sadly, uh, an American airline would lose his trusty Telecaster later that same year, so he borrowed SIDS going forward. Now, skipping ahead a few years to 1970 and to his work on Adam Hart Mother, Technology hasn't quite caught up to Gilmore and his quest to shape that lovely guitar tone that we all know and love from the 70s and beyond. He was still pretty much using the same three effects. The Dallas Arbiter Fuzz Face, the Vox Wah, and the Binson Echo Rec 2. And little else of note, uh, except one, as he was now starting to dabble in note modulation, though not pedal modulation. You see, way back in the 40s, some clever fella named Donald Leslie noticed that if you quickly rotated a set of speakers in a cabinet, you get a noticeable swirly warble effect to the notes being played through them. Now, while it was initially designed to be used with the Hammond organ, by the late 60s, a few select and clever guitarists started running their guitar amplifiers through these rotating speaker cabinets, looking to to modulate their tone and sound and add a bit of warble to it, Gilmore being one of them. The uh, Univide pedal, which aimed to replicate this warble in a compact pedal form, also came around this same time and was often used by Jimi Hendrix. However, Gilmore himself at this point in time chose to go the rotating speaker route. So in conclusion with regards to the Adam Hart Mother album and tour for a two or three year period here, not much has changed as far as Gilmore's effects chain goes. He was known to try out a few different fuzz pedals here and there in a live setting, but the down Alice Arbiter was a mainstay in the studio. However, uh, Gilmore's guitar arsenal was growing and he had switched amps at this point. His new amp of choice, and an amp that would remain a constant for many, many years, was the fairly new, at the time, High Watt DR-103, a large 100 watt head fashioned upon the popular Marshall Super Lead amplifier a.k.a. the Marshall Plexi. Now, as far as guitars go, in the two years since his debut with the band in 68, Gilmore was still using a Fender Telecaster, a new, at least to him one, uh, a brown 59 Tele with a white pickguard. This one. Plus, he had picked himself up a couple of strats, a white 66 strat, this one, and another one that would go on to become just a wee bit more famous, this one bought at Manny's Music in New York City in the fall of 1970. Interestingly enough, uh, from the factory, the famous black Strat was actually a sunburst Strat. Uh, Manny's had painted it black before selling it to Gilmore. This guitar would also be modified on numerous occasions over the years, both cosmetically and internally. He also picked up a Gibson J45 acoustic at some point since 1968, as well as a Fender 1000 lap steel slide guitar, which go would go on to be featured quite prominently in much of his work with Pink Floyd in the future. Regardless, a few new guitars in hand and a new amp, not much else had changed with Gilmore's setup effect-wise between 1968 and 1970. Jumping ahead a few years more to 1973 and his setup for Dark Side of the Moon, Gilmore finally has his first true pedal board, as guitar pedals are finally starting to be produced in number and variety. While still utilizing the uh, trusty Dallas Arbiter fuzz face for much of his distortion, he would add the new Color Sound Power Boost pedal to his pedal board as well. 
a pedal which was much more of an overdrive uh, pedal with EQ rather than a straight up fuzz like the Dallas Arbiter. He also added a DeArmin volume pedal, the Univox Univibe, and the MXR Phase 90 to his pedal board around this point in time as well to join the already present Vox Wah, which would soon be traded out for the Dunlop Crybaby Wah. His delay of choice during this period was still the trusty Binson Echo Rec 2, though he was also starting to experiment a lot with different types of guitar synth processors that were slowly starting to hit the market. Now that money was much less of an issue for Gilmore and the band, he began looking for any way possible to shape and color his tone, regardless of cost, and was quickly becoming a guitarist on the leading and cutting edge of guitar technology, both live and in the studio. By this point, uh, during the recording of Dark Side, the Black Strat had become his guitar of choice for nearly everything, though he had by now collected quite an arsenal of different guitars. The most notable of these was a custom-made Bill Lewis 24 fret guitar, quite the rarity in the early 70s, as the Super Strat was still quite a few years off at this point. Uh, as far as amplification goes in 70s, the High Watt DR-103 was still his amp of choice, though a Fender Twin Silverface 100 was known to have been used now and again, both in the studio and live. Alright then, let's finish up part one of this video with another three or four year jump to 1977 and the Animals album. Uh, a, a few rather significant changes occurred with Gilmore's gear over the intervening four years since Dark Side of the Moon. Most notably, his partnership and collaboration with British pedal effect design wizard Pete Cornish. The man who was basically considered the leading pioneer when it came to elaborate, fully custom guitar pedal board systems during the 70s. This guy worked with everybody. Uh, Pete would take over control of Gilmore's signal chain and add a whole host of new effects to Gilmore's arsenal, including a number of pedals designed by Pete himself, including the Pete Cornish PC Custom Fuzz P1 and a Pete Cornish volume pedal, the Dallas Arbiter Fuzz face was still ever present on Gilmore's pedal board, but he was starting to turn more and more to the Electro Harmonics Big Muff Pie, which would eventually become almost synonymous with Gilmore's distorted tone in the latter half of the 70s and beyond. He and Pete also switched out the MXR Phase 90 for the Phase 100 at this point. The Univox Univide pedal still had a place on his board, yet he still preferred the rotating speaker cabinets for the most part when he was looking for a little bit of warble. The, uh, the Vox Wah by now had been replaced with the Dunlop Crybaby and uh, a couple of other essential pedals were added as well. Now, they're pretty essential these days, I have to say, but at the time, a lot of these were very new technologies on the market. One being the MXR Dynacomp compression pedal and another being an MXR noise gate. Uh, as far as delay goes, well, it's still the Benson Echo Rec 2, which he had relied upon since nearly the beginning. It was still handling the job just fine and was still an essential part of his rig. Uh, another fun and interesting effect that Gilmore discovered around this time was the Heil Talkbox, which uh, is very cleverly used for the pig squeals on the track Pigs from Animals. And uh, near the end of the Animals tour, he also added a very early iteration of the Electro Harmonics Electric Mistress, a flanger chorus pedal, uh, which he added to his board, uh, a pedal that he would rely upon heavily in a live setting uh, during the following years. For amplification, he was still using the High Watt DR-103, though the Fender Twins still found favor now and again, and he was still quite fond of running these through the Leslie cabinets. Uh, guitars at this point were becoming too many to count, uh, yet the Black Strat and his 59 Fender Telecaster were getting most of the attention from Gilmore, both live 
and on the Animals album itself. In the intervening years since the Dark Side album, he also switched out the Fender 1000 pedal steel for a couple of Jetson pedal steels, uh, a pedal steel which has become somewhat synonymous with Gilmore since its acquisition in 1975 or thereabouts. And I think that just about covers it for the first 10 years or so. Now, I, I did my research, but of course uh, mistakes get made, so forgive any gear faux pas that I may have made with regards to this 10-year span in Gilmore's gear and effect timeline. Would just like to give a big thanks to Bjorn Rees, the uh, founder of the website Gil Morish, uh, an absolutely amazing compendium website of all things David Gilmore. Uh, that site, coupled with a few trips to Wikipedia as well, helped me put all this information together. Uh, I certainly hope you enjoyed that and maybe found it somewhat interesting and helpful. Uh, please keep an eye out for part two, uh, where we have a look at the evolution of Gilmore's gear and tone from animals onward to the present day. Thanks as ever for watching. Uh, hope you're well out there in your little guitar corner of the world. Uh, take care of yourselves and those around you, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.